Arizona. We are strong and dependent and we don't back down. Neither do I. As a prosecutor, I've built my life and career here in urban and rural Arizona, going after drug cartels, child predators, even locking up corporate criminals. From the boardroom to the border, I've seen a lot of bad guys. It doesn't matter who you are, if you break the law, I'm going to put you behind bars. I had to deal with the consequences of DC's failed border policies up close. I took on gangs, human smugglers, sex traffickers, and even terrorists. Now I'm interviewing for a new job, to protect our border, to protect our heroic public safety officers, to protect our kids and the most vulnerable, to protect our constitution and the rule of law, and to protect Arizona. And I promise you, I won't back down. Never have, never will. I'm Lacey Cooper and I'm running to be your Attorney General. Welcome, this is ASAP Elite Podcast, and your host, Mr. Robert Penn, has given me the honor of introducing a very special guest. We have Lacey Cooper, who is the candidate for the Attorney General of our great state of Arizona. Not an easy position, uh, one where all eyes are on you, right, Lacey? Um, but uh, before we get into that, Lacey, uh, you are local, you grew up here in Arizona, and before we started recording, you, you kind of gave me a little bit about your story, and I think it's very interesting. Walk, walk us through your journey to becoming first an attorney and now wanting to be the attorney general of our state. Kind of just give us a little bit of a kind of a highlight of, of your journey to get here today. Sure. Thanks uh, for having me on today. No problem. And great job, Juan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I was actually born in New Mexico, right on the uh, Texas border in oil country. And uh, my family moved here when I was seven. So I grew up in the valley. I went to Dobson High School, go Mustangs. I can I can do the fight song if you need me okay. to. Uh, and then I went to Texas A&M for my undergrad at the University of Texas for law school. I When I graduated law school, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't even know if I wanted to be an attorney. So I came back here and I passed the bar, but uh, was without a job and really very directionless uh, until I got offered a job up in Payson as a prosecutor, as a deputy Gila County attorney. And uh, I am confident that God led me to that job. Uh, he had picked that job for me. I'm very justice oriented. And uh, my first week as a prosecutor, I thought this is the funnest thing I've ever done. I had so much joy in the work. Uh, I did that for six and a half years. And then I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office where I was a federal prosecutor. And so almost 15 years of experience um, putting bad guys behind bars. How did I end up going down this journey? Well, I pr probably started in 2016. I was asked to apply for um, U.S. Attorney, which was a presidential appointment. Uh, would have required Senate confirmation. I went through that process. I actually was supposed to be appointed the uh, interim U.S. attorney, but John McCain blocked me. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Senator McCain. He's uh, yes. He, he, he had he he didn't meet with me. He it's not that he rejected me personally. He just had somebody that he wanted to get yeah. the job, and so it didn't matter who else you know was applying for it. They they were a no go for him. But so, so even then. Sadly, you were a victim of a political kind of maneuvering. And yeah. even in that situation, as a U.S. attorney, yeah, something absolutely. you had to deal with and had to accept and had to kind of, uh, yeah. that's, that's tough. But I felt, uh, you know, I, it was a great experience. It really was. I, I was able to go back to D.C. a couple times and interview. I met Attorney General Sessions. And uh, I was able to start building a network in, in this political world that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. So that maybe introed me into maybe getting into politics one day. And then in 2019, I was asked to apply for Maricopa County attorney uh, when Bill Montgomery was elevated to the Supreme Court. And so I applied for that job. I, I got, you know, runner up in that, but again, built my network more. And that time it was not just a, a, an appointment, but I would have had to run for office. 
it would be an elected position. And so I had to do a little soul searching. You know, would I be willing to put my name out there? Would I be willing to expose my, you know, who I am, where I live? And at the time I was prosecuting cartels and terrorists. So the idea of telling everybody, you know, what my address was or putting, you know, my name on a, a ballot, having photos of me publicly available would, would be, it was a really big deal. But I decided that I would be willing to do it. I had, you know, some conversations with my family to make sure that they would be okay with it as well. And even though I didn't get that position, now I was prepared, you know, emotionally, spiritually, that if the opportunity arose for me to run for office, then I could do it. Battle tested. Yeah. And, and and what, may I call you Lacey or? Uh, yeah, please call me Lacey. Lacey. Okay. I just want to make sure that I got, I got it right. Um, in, in your experience as a prosecutor, obviously not an easy task because I'm imagining each case is different. Each scenario is different. How has that experience, whether it's Gila County here in Maricopa County, U.S. Attorney's Office, how has that helped you kind of shape your vision now as now Attorney General and, and, and how you would be able to function in that office and be able to execute the, the duties. Cause there's very many different areas of it, right. but in, in being on the side of, like you said, with cartels and, you know, putting bad guys away and whatnot, how has that helped kind of formulate what your plan would be if elected? Well, I've um, sort of, as you alluded to, I've seen some pretty heinous stuff during my career. I've seen uh, the worst of the worst in humanity. And um, you kind of have to, figure out if you're going to be one of those people who becomes cynical and uh, knowing the, the, the darkness that exists, or are you going to stay positive and figure out how can I be, you know, a, a source of change and good and, you know, and helping victims and, and that sort of thing. So I think the biggest thing that I have uh, learned or the way that I've grown from the prosecution experience that will help me to be an attorney general is just a really thick skin or just a toughness because I have taken on the worst, you know, of, of, of the people that are in society and taken them down. And so, you know, if a politician comes after me, I'm like, eh, it's not, you know, not that right. big a deal. Been there, done that. <laughs> I think that that role, and we're seeing that, you know, there's a lot of this going on right now. There, there's a lot of attacks on that person who's in that job, mm -hmm. a lot of political attacks, personal attacks, you know, the opportunity for threats. I've been threatened before. I've kind of moved through that. So you have to be able to take the barbs and the arrows that come with that job and move through it to come to the right decision and be and to affect the right decision, you know. Mm -hmm. well, on top of that, uh, the you add in the product of being a role model also for young women. You know, when you're done with your career, what would, if you look back, what would you be most proud of? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly very proud of the work that I did on behalf of victims in particular. Uh, I have prosecuted some people for, um, you know, molesting young girls. But you asked more about, you know, being a role model. It's been really important to me since I was quite young to um, invest in others mentor others. Uh, so I have been um, running a Bible study for judges, lawyers, and law students because that's like all levels of the legal profession and making sure that the, the next generation uh, is able to um, succeed, especially women in the legal profession because there are a lot of areas of legal profession where it's still male-dominated. Sure. And having somebody who has had success in the profession that can help encourage other women, I think is, is super important. And, and do you feel that some of those attacks, like you said, threats and so forth, is because of that, the, the gender issue, maybe a, a lack of respect or a lack of giving the appropriate place to somebody who's earned the position, who, who has earned the title, so to speak, who's earned the job. Um, have you seen that in your journey um, from prosecutor to where you are now to candidate where maybe some of that came into play where maybe if you were, weren't a woman, Maybe you were, wouldn't have been threatened. Maybe you wouldn't have got the hard looks. Yeah, of course, I've I've seen some of that in my mm -hmm. career. And out on the campaign trail, uh, you know, I'm seated now, but I'm I'm all of five foot three, right? I'm <laughs> I'm kind of a small woman too. So uh, people out of the gate um, underestimate, you know, me. Big mistake on their part, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
It's, it's, and I've used it to my advantage yeah, in the courtroom. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I, in the courtroom, it's like, hey, everybody, I'm so glad to be here. And then I tear them apart on the That's stand, right. you know, and, yeah. and they go to prison. And I, I love every minute of it, For you sure. know. I walk them right down that primrose path. But I think that people can underestimate me because... I'm a female, and do I have the thick skin that's needed for the job? Do I have the aggression, you know, that's needed to get the job done and to and to not, you know, be swayed by um, politics, but to just do the right thing? Um, yeah, but I was very fortunate. When I first started out in Gila County, the Gila County attorney was a female, and my direct supervisor was also a female. So I was able to have role models yeah. in my career who were strong um, ethical women who were great trial attorneys, mm -hmm. and it and it didn't occur to me until maybe later in my career that 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 was not a common you know um, experience for all women. Yeah. So so if if you're if elected, I mean obviously this is a big issue now as as we're kind of moving into the twenty twenties um, about you know there was a Me Too movement things of that nature. Um, I know that there's kind of a hidden underbelly here in in Arizona with sex trafficking females as attorney general, what, what are some of the things that you're envisioning that you'd be able to do to kind of combat both, whether it's workplace harassment um, or it's a young girl being taken from her family with no one knowing where the heck she is. Um, as we see in the case of Alicia Navarro, I'm sure it's, it's a very well-known case here locally um, as attorney general. What are some of the things that, that, that you would want to do to help combat that and, and help resolve it? Yeah, child sex trafficking is huge here in the Phoenix area because we are a big metropolitan mm -hmm. area. And uh, not talked about very much. It seems like it's kind of it's, it's the world, huh? they're scared to talk about it. Almost, would you agree? It's, 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 it's hey, well, just to add to that. When I moved here, that was the biggest thing that uh, they were saying about to, you know about my children. You know, uh, it's that type of area around here. Oh, Once really? You were here. warned that yes. you need to be careful. Yes, mm -hmm. well, that was four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's one thing about it. That's the very first thing I was warned. Not about the police, not right. about crime or, you know, B&Es, you know, strictly sex trafficking. Right. right. So I cut you off, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. I, I was just going to say that it, when you, um, when a child's being trafficked, they are taken away from family, community, you know, the town that they're familiar with, because that's how they're able to be controlled. So... Phoenix, I think, provides an opportunity to, to hide kids. You know, you take them from Mesa to Glendale, and they're going to have no idea where they are. And then you take them from Glendale to another city in the United States. And that's really how this works. And so Phoenix is just, it's its a high traffic area for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, not not least of which is, is sex trafficking. But we're also seeing quite a bit more sex trafficking coming from the, through the border. Okay. And yes. that it's not, you know, there are folks obviously who are paying coyotes to get here, but there are also people who are being brought through the border for purposes of human trafficking, right. sex trafficking, and labor trafficking. I think that that's a way, border security is so important to me, and it's a num my number one priority. I think that that's a, a place to focus some efforts that is not being focused, you know, right now is the trafficking of humans through the border. Now, would, would the attorney general have the tools at their disposal? Did you have what is necessary to be able to accomplish these things? Because, um, you know, there's always the argument, is it a federal issue? Is it a state issue? And it, if you study U.S. history, there's always been that conflict, whether it's the federal government's responsibilities at the states, and they always seem to kind of clash. So now, as the sitting attorney general, how would you be able to navigate that river to not only accomplish the objective, but to be able to do so in a way that you're able to be effective at it. And, and I want to add to that too, and also speak about the efficiency of the current state of the border. Oh, well, the border <laughs> is a disaster right now. It, it just is. Uh, and yes, the Attorney General can um, deal with human trafficking at the mm -hmm. border, not with the um, people who are coming across who right. paid the cartels. The, the immigration has been um, decided by the Supreme Court that immigration is entirely a federal issue. Mm -hmm. So if somebody tells you differently than that, they're wrong. <laughs> the Supreme Court has already told us that. But there are lots of other things happening at the border that we have state crimes related to mm -hmm. that the Attorney General could, can help with. And human trafficking is one of them. Uh, we, Our laws, our immigration laws, are kind of terrible. 
And they lure pe- the laws themselves are luring people here because folks come and they claim asylum, whether they have a valid asylum claim or not, and then they're released into the United States to wait several years until they have a court hearing and you know they can decide whether they want to show up to that hearing or not. There, I just read an a article that over a million people are currently in the country who have a order of deportation. It's, it's a, yeah, over a million people. So um, they either have absconded or the current administration doesn't have the will or the resources to, to. So those are people that have already gone through all the, the process, Just you know? You yeah. yeah. It's not like they're waiting to find out that they ha- have a valid asylum claim. They're, they're past that, yeah. but still they're not being taken back to their home countries. And what happens when you have a system like that, where people are rewarded for coming into the country illegally, they will come to the country illegally yeah. to get the benefit. And, and we have, uh, everybody who comes to the border illegally pays the cartels to get here. So we have a system where we're, uh, we are creating a situation where the f- cartels are getting funded. Uh, the cartels are terrorist organizations. They're getting more resources because of the humans coming into the country, which allows them to buy more guns and be more heavily armed and to build their, you know, build their, their uh, resources, their assets and that sort of thing. Um, and th- we just, we're making them more powerful by having the laws that we have. We also are creating this humanitarian crisis. Like I said, the, the human trafficking that's happening at the border, the drugs coming across the border. I just saw an article that there were um, twice as many fentanyl pills seized in Arizona last year than the year before. Wow. And this year we're on pace to seize more pills than in 2021. It's definitely a problem. It's a big huge, issue. A yes. huge problem. And this is not... Obviously, fentanyl that is prescribed by a doctor, this is the fentanyl that the cartels make. And their car- cartels make fentanyl pills that have hot spots in them so that one pill can be lethal. And the uh, DEA would tell you that 42% of pills that are out on the street are, have a lethal dose. That's what is coming through our border right now. It, it is a, a horribly dangerous situation. It's, it's a humanitarian crisis. Um, and the laws that we have right now are inadequate, and the policies of this administration, I think, are, are um, adding to the problem at the border. So, so would that be your primary focus once you once elected? That's my number one priority. I, I feel like we have to fix the border security is is national security. Uh, it, it's a problem for people to be able to sneak into our country and us not know who came in. The the folks that get apprehended. Uh, commonly are they're the ones who are just like self-surrendering to to border patrol if somebody self-surrenders to border patrol they probably don't have a criminal history they might have an immigration history but they probably don't have a criminal history the people that don't self-surrender to border patrol are the problems and uh, i you know they're running for a reason they're running for a reason they're they're evading escape for evading apprehension for a reason and and we had 400,000 people last year that we know were able to evade apprehension by Border Patrol and are now in our country. And we have people coming across the border with serious felony, you know, convictions. We have people coming across the border who are actual cartel members, not just migrants, but, you know, cartel members. We have people coming across the border who are on the terrorism watch list. That is the threat. You have to control your border to make sure that, that those folks are not coming in and then create a lawful immigration process that's more streamlined for people who just are going to come here and work and be uh, productive members of society. So in, in changing gears a little bit from, because it, it all ties in is I uh, spoke at Loma Linda elementary school a few years ago. And one of the scariest things that I heard from one of the teachers was that fentanyl was in the eighth graders population had been found. It, it, it's been a couple students had used Obviously, as AG, you're the top law enforcement officer in the state. In that vein, when it comes to our children and our schools and this junk finding its way in, um, what objectives would you have on that level Mm -hmm. to try to protect those children but then hold the ones that are bringing it to them accountable? Mm -hmm. I mean, as AG, what what would you be able to do to combat that? Yeah, you remember, you know, just say no to drugs. Yeah, uh, Nancy Reagan. <laughs> Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan. Yeah. yeah, we were young. We were young. 
But you guys um, are really young. I was in elementary <laughs> school. <laughs> uh, of of course, there was um, you know this great initiative to educate kids, mm -hmm. and kids don't always make the right decision, but at least they were educated in making that decision, right? Yeah, it worked. <laughs> yeah. yeah, especially growing up in Detroit at that age. At that age, when uh, you know when I was coming through, uh -huh. yeah, it worked. You're scared to death of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see the people. You know, you right. actually see the people and why not to do this. Thing. Right. The same where I grew up. Yeah. See someone on a PCP overdose and five cops trying to take them down. Oh, it was crack. scary stuff. You know, yeah. I'm cracking my neighborhood. It was mm -hmm. scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That scared well, me enough. We need to do that again because I don't think that, I mean, uh, it's still not a common, commonly known that the little blue pill that has an M30 stamp on it is not actually Oxy. You think, you know, kids think it is. They think it's, uh, a prescription drug that somebody got out of their grandma's medicine cabinet. And as long as I take one, I'm going to feel really good. The reality is that they're made, they're fentanyl pills created in uh, Mexico by the cartels that are made to look like oxy. And one pill will kill you. Wow. That is a message that I don't think is getting out. And so what do we need to do? Well, I think the attorney general needs to be uh, a, you know, very vocal in helping to educate our, you know, the Arizona population about what is fentanyl? How do I recognize it? You know, what are the co potential consequences if I take even one pill? That message is not getting widespread like it should, especially in our schools. So is, is that an issue um, where you feel maybe the AG's office is not vocal enough, not visible enough, visible enough? Because again, it's the top law enforcement official of the state. Yeah. We can use the term the top cop. Right. Um, like you said, it's maybe not being said, it's not being done. So would one of your objectives be to, to create that visibility so that people, when they see Lacey, they know, uh-oh, <laughs> yeah. she means business, or, or th this is what this is about. Um, is that one of your objectives as well, to bring more visibility to the office, to bring a voice to it? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for the deterrent value of sending a message to drug traffickers right. that, hey, I'm on to you, and this is going to be taken very right. seriously, but also... Um, to getting into schools and, and educating our kids. I, I want to uh, send the assistant AGs into schools with this message, but also, you know, I want to encourage them to help teach, um, coach the mock trial teams and the moot court teams, right? You have this you're training as an attorney, go and help the next generation that's interested in that, you know, maybe becoming a lawyer one day and uh, be a role model, you know, to the next generation. I think that that would be a great way to um, have an imprint on on our youth is to have the, these prosecutors go in and, and help coach their teams. My question is, uh, what is the best way to improve police and minority relations? Mm. Gosh, Rob, that's a hard one. I know, it's, a, it's, a, it's going back to digging a whole bunch of uh, dirt up, you know, and I have to correct it. I yeah. understand that, but where to start? Yeah, hundreds one of years. One pebble in the of... water causes a ripple. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I... Um, one thing that I've noticed is when you have uh, somebody in a position of authority or at church, if you have somebody on stage who uh, has your same color, it makes you feel more comfortable and more safe and, and more secure. So I think it was a big deal for the Phoenix Police Department to choose Jerry Williams as their chief. She just announced that she's retiring. But I think that helps send a message and also helps you know, draw in law enforcement officers who aren't white, when they see that the folks who are in charge uh, are not. Is there not a, a, a stipulation that says that, you know, you have to be from a certain proximity within the community? You know, uh, say, can't live, you know, 30 miles outside of the community to get to police or something like that? I don't think so. I think that, you know, Phoenix police officers can live anywhere in Phoenix, but we know that that's a pretty varied um, spectrum of locations. So I, th I don't think, I think most police departments don't have, a, you have to live in your, in the same neighborhood where you're policing. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting idea though. It, it is, it is. And uh, that's the way, you know, you're in tune with the community, you know, uh, you're there a few years, you know, you're all 20, now your kids are raised in the community and you know the community, you have a pulse with the community. You're uh, less willing to be, uh, you know, instinctful or just, you know, to react in a certain way because of patience and familiarity. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think then the then neighbors know you also right. and perhaps 
if you're somebody who grew up with them, you know, hopefully have some mutual respect. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Uh, we have a problem at the border, though. Usually, folks who want to join Customs and Border Protection mm -hmm. and work at the port of entry, for instance, they don't get to live uh, in the in the city that they grew up in and work well, right. <laughs> because they get paid off too easily, and corruption is more rampant yeah. if you uh, are, you know, working in the same plate city that you live. That's another side of the coin. Yeah. yeah. I don't they see that as um, as big a problem as, as what you're proposing for, you know, city law enforcement. That's how it was where I grew up in Inkster, Michigan. Uh, all the cops in my neighborhood went to school with my dad. You know, they were all, we knew each other's families. You know, a lot of situations where, uh, you know, I was protected, highly protected, you know, and where I grew up in Detroit in that area because of that. And because they grew up in that community and their parents were our teachers. You know, different things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't hear about that so much, much. Do you think, though, Rob, that the reputation for law enforcement, and especially in the black community, has gotten so poor that it would be more, less likely for someone who, to want to become a cop? Yes, it's definitely an obstacle. Yeah. Yes, it, it makes you uh, per, a person that was born to be a civil service person as yourself. It makes you have to put things in consideration that you shouldn't have to following your heart and your passion. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we need to figure out some ways to incentivize folks to go into the profession. I can give you a bunch of ideas. Okay. We'll fix that problem. But. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, also, one of the functions of the AG's office is to protect the consumer. And in the internet age, um, you know, I work at a law firm and then we get calls all the time for people who are being scammed, um, disreputable businesses. Um, that is part of the AG's function. So in that light, to change gears a little bit, um, because obviously we want to try to cover everything that the AG's office does. I don't think a lot of people even realize what the attorney general's office does. Right. It is a very big position. Um, after the governor, it's probably the, the most important position in the state. Um, and I don't say that lightly because again, we talk top cop. Um, so as far as the consumer and, and the person out there, whether it's the old lady in Sun City or the young person at ASU who's a victim of you know a, a shady business or an internet scam, um, do you have any plans yet for that apparatus and how you're going to be able to enforce that and, and give people that sense of security that someone has their back if they're the victim of a crime, especially an internet crime or, or a business crime? Yeah, there, there is a Consumer Protection Bureau. It's super important uh, yes. at the AG's office. One of the things that the AG does well, I think, is to um, have entry points for people to make complaints when they believe that they have been harmed, whether it's the in uh, as a consumer or uh, someone who uh, realizes that their grandmother has been exploited, or if it's somebody who believes that their civil rights have been violated. Uh, you can just show up at the Attorney General's office and say, hey, I, ha I have a problem and I think that I've been Okay. victimized, or I think that I've been hurt, or you can make a, a complaint online, or you can make a phone call. I mean, they really do have easy access for the public. Now, a lot of the time, you're, have your civil rights actually been violated? Maybe not. But do you just want, you know, sometimes you want somebody to tell you, could you hear my story and tell me if, if I, something, you Someone know. Someone will listen. Something doesn't feel right. Something doesn't feel right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and maybe the, at the end of the day, the attorney says, what you're describing is not a criminal violation. What you're describing is not a civil rights mm -hmm. violation. Uh, but I'm sorry that happened to you. You know, there's not a law that that governs exactly you know, what happened. But uh, it just gives people answers and peace of mind. And I, I appreciate that and want to continue that. Well, so is that something you feel is adequate now or something you would want to improve on? Everything that I've heard is that they do that quite well. Mm -hmm. Well, before we get out of here... I want to uh, give you the floor. Why should we vote for Lacey Cool for Attorney General of Arizona? Mm -hmm. Well, I focused on uh, the border quite a bit in, in our discussions here. It is my number one priority. Uh, I think that it's the number one issue facing our state today. And until we get that under control, there's just so many other problems that, that arise from the drugs coming into our country, um, the migrants who come into the country and don't have any place to go, and our, you know their status here is is illegal until they 
right? Or they can't get work or whatever. There are too many problems that, that come out of that that we need to, to solve that first. So uh, I am the best uh, candidate because I actually have border security experience. I was the border security section chief for the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, I led a team of people who day in and day out were enforcing our country's border laws. I personally prosecuted coyotes, gang members, cartels, uh, terrorists. Uh, I have, you know, changed immigration policy to try to deal with the influx of migrants coming across the border. I have the experience to, to get that job done and to hold the Biden administration accountable for some of their decisions that are making it, the problems worse at the border. And I also am the law and order candidate. I have three times the prosecution experience of anyone else in the race. So for the top cop, uh, I am the best candidate to deal with the rising violent crime rates that are going on in our state right now, the rising homicide rates in many of our cities. Uh, I just have the background and the experience that our state needs today. I support you, Mexico. Thank you. And I just have to be family well also. Awesome. Thank you for coming by. Thanks for having Just me. Just thank you. Great conversation. Yeah. Why? You were great, brother. <laughs> oh, wow. I try. I try. I was impressed. Like, oh, hell. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Hey, well, look forward to seeing you next week. We're out on ASAP Elite. Thank you.